such a great reading this morning from Mark. But before we get serious, I want to share with you something that I've read this week that I think is really funny. So I hope you do as well. Sherlock Holmes and his trusted sidekick Watson went camping. They had bedded down for the night and were lying in their sleeping bags on their backs. And Mr. Holmes said to Mr. Watson, would you look up and tell me what you see? And Watson said, well, I see a sky filled with stars. And Mr. Holmes said, what does that tell you, Mr. Watson? And Watson replied, well, theologically, this, this tells me that God is great and that I'm small. Astronomically, there must be multiplied millions of stars in our galaxy. Atmospherically, it tells me that we will probably have good weather tomorrow. <laughs> Watson asked, Mr. Holmes, what does this tell you? To which Mr. Holmes replied, someone stole our tent. <laughs> I think that's great. So if you forget, if you remember nothing else, you've got something good to share over coffee or a soft drink later. Last week uh, in the Gospel of John, we saw the story of Philip who came to the Lord. He was a, a follower of John the Baptist and he brought Nathaniel and they also followed Christ. And so that was the the call of the first disciples, which now is, is continued in Mark. And uh, to try to give you a little bit of background of what was happening, the kind of thing that I really appreciate is that it had been at least six months since Jesus was baptized uh, by John at, in the Jordan River. And John was in Galilee, whereas Jesus during these early months of ministry was to the south in an un in unconspicuous area. After John was arrested by Herod, then Jesus moved up to the Sea of Galilee and began to minister in the same area that John was and really with the same message that you heard in the gospel that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. The, the Sea of Galilee is about 12 miles long and about seven miles wide. And it was in Jesus' day, it was the center of a, of a prosperous fishing industry. When uh, Catherine and I were on our trip to Israel last fall, before the, the war broke out, we were on the sea, and it's just such a, a peaceful, beautiful setting. It's, uh, it's just easy to imagine what was happening on the shore as, as Jesus was there. And uh, the town of Magdala, which is on, on the shore of the sea, we had stayed in a, in a hotel for two or three days, just a beautiful setting. But in Greek, the, the name Magdala means the place where fish are salted, because right in that area was a sardine pickling center. You don't think of that as very romantic, but that was a huge industry by the sea. And it was around that sea where there was so much commerce that, that Jesus called his first disciples here in Mark with a profound Im uh, invitation. To me, it still is just about incomprehensible to believe that the, the, the first men that he called had a career, had security, and they left everything because they understood something about Jesus that many didn't. First, Simon and Andrew left their nets to follow Jesus. Then Jesus calls James and John, and who left their father and, their, and the hired hands in the boat. And uh, why did they? What was so important that they would leave a career that was generations old to follow someone who was just beginning a prophetic teaching, miracle working ministry? In the book of Luke, he talks about this uh, in chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding districts and he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. This was early in Jesus' ministry. The religious leaders of the day didn't understand how he could be a threat. And the people, the people loved, they rushed to hear him and his teaching and possibly to receive a healing or a miracle. But the fishermen is where I want to focus on because in many ways, we are those fishermen who are going about 
our business, doing what we believe we're here to do, to take care of ourselves, to provide for our needs, for our family. Uh, in the Sea of Galilee, fishermen worked around the calendar year because the temperatures were even fairly mild in the wintertime. Jesus chose Capern Capernaum on the, on the sea, on the coast of the sea, as his home base, and brought him into contact with literally hundreds of, of fishermen. Historians say that there was an average about, of about 300 fishing boats on the sea at the time that Jesus was there, every day. And out of 300 boats, which had several men on each boat, he chose four fishermen out of the many that were there and said, come, follow me. They, they weren't uh, especially gifted. It wasn't that they were extraordinary. It had to be that, that Jesus, our Lord, knew what was in their hearts and understood that they would be able to say yes to something that they, they didn't understand. If you look at your bulletin cover, uh, it's, it's a perfect introduction to this, to this gospel. Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust the good news. The word time that's used here in Mark 1.15, in Greek it's the word kairos. And, and it, it doesn't mean it's 10 o'clock in the morning. It means it's a pregnant time out of which much could, could come if you're attentive. And Jesus is saying, this is your day. This is your time to make a decision that will affect the rest of your life. And by God's grace, for whatever reason, those four fishermen understood that much, and they felt that leaving their career was nothing because something was in front of them that they had only dreamed about. And when the one who John the Baptist identified as Messiah said to them, come with me, they left everything immediately. And each one of us, will have that Kairos moment. I certainly had mine in December of 17, 1976, not 17, <laughs> 76, but 1976, and it, it changed my life dramatically because I understood for the first time in my life who Jesus was and what he offered, and, and the details of life simply didn't matter. And that's what was happening with the disciples. He doesn't pick disciples because they are special, but because he is special, and he can bring something out of them that they didn't even know was there. One, one key to our understanding of what the call of disciples is about comes if you read all four Gospels who give a little bit different aspects of the, of the call of the first disciples. And when, when you place them all together, what you, you learn readily is that Andrew was already a disciple of John the Baptist. He understood that the Messiah was coming and that John the Baptist said, this is the one, he's the Lamb of God. And when Jesus came to them, he understood that now he had a chance to follow the footsteps of the Messiah and see his life transformed forever. And so that, that to me is what is, is so remarkable. They could leave everything because they understood that a, a centuries old promise was, was being fulfilled in front of their eyes. And so a part of, for you as well, uh, why are you here? What's the meaning of your life? The disciples thought at that point, it was simply to help feed their families, to go out on the sea most days of the year and bring back a catch that they could sell and then, and then feed their families. But something greater was here beyond their understanding. And uh, the impact that Jesus had in just those words, follow me, was incredible. Their lives were dramatically changed in a way they couldn't understand. At that point, they could not possibly grasp that Jesus was going to die and then be raised from the dead. Even right up to, the, to, to what we call Good Friday, they had a very hard time understanding it but yet they followed him because of who he was revealed to be. And that speaks about discipleship, which is a, a part of the call in our life as well, that when you come to, to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 
that isn't the end of your spiritual walk, it's just the beginning. And so the question is, what does this mean for me? What impact can I have on the lives of others now that I have come to a pregnant time in my life where I understand that my life can change if I say yes, that I no longer have to be the, the captive of the dreary life that I had. And as the, the fishermen on that day assessed their own lives, they realized that Jesus was offering meaning in their lives that was entirely new to them. It would be like, it would be like I was uh, as a teenager, as a young adult, went to church usually a couple times a week, sat through ritual, knew the words by heart. It had no impact on my life. They were just words. I was a part of a, of a religious community that it was just about fellowship. But then on that one day in December of that year, all of a sudden I understood what all the fuss was about, who Jesus was, what the gospel really said, and how it applied to my life. And it, it, was, it was transformational. And it was like that at some level for the, disciple, for the disciples. Jesus answered questions about the meaning of life that they hadn't even fully asked yet. But they enthusiastically followed him because they knew this was a part of their destiny, a part of their future. We all ask questions uh, initially. Sometimes they're daddy questions. When our children were little, I loved the questions they had. Uh, daddy, why is the sky blue? Daddy, and this was a summertime question. Daddy, what are mosquitoes for? And then uh, at dinner, Daddy, why do I have to eat vegetables? And the obvious answer for that one is, because your mommy said so. <laughs> that one I could get away with. But questions are a part of our life. It starts when we're young and they're, they're natural questions to which there really aren't obvious answers to all of them. But then as we mature, the questions change a little bit and they become more personal about the focus of our life. Who should I be in a relationship with? During that era of uh, teenage years and, and on into college, I, I discovered that I really liked being with girls. And the question is, will I, will I be married? Will I find that one person? And by God's grace through our, our youth group, I did, Tammy. And we were blessed to marry for 48 years. Was that the purpose and meaning for my life? It was a beginning. Then what kind of work shall we engage in? What opportunities do you have? My dad, uh, as a young adult, after he left the farm in Denmark, he became a, uh, he worked for a company that harvested trees and brought from the forest to the cities, brought the lumber that would build, build homes. He would climb up those trees with the saws and, and he thought that was maybe his future. Then he met his future wife, our mom, and he felt like that wasn't a suitable career, and he uh, got a job as, a, as an apprentice for a bricklayer, and that became his future. And when we immigrated to this country, that was his first job, and uh, by which he provided for us. It wasn't a thing at that point in his life that he asked, God, he was a Christian, but he, he didn't ask God, what do I do with my life? He knew that he had to provide for, for his family at that point, and he did. Uh, this was during World War II. But then later he came to see that life was more than about my work, and he saw that one of his strengths was to pray, and he began to pray for the children that they didn't have yet and for their future and for what we ought to do, be doing as a family. And then another question, where do I want to live in this period of my life? Tammy's in my first home was an efficiency apartment over a, a men's clothing store in Columbus that regularly got robbed. So it was exciting. Cops would come up and question us about what might have happened below us. Uh, we felt like that wasn't going to be the future, but it was a nice beginning. What am I here for? What work should I engage in? And uh, where should I live for this period in my life? And at some point, all of us enter into a, a stage in life in which those questions 
become even more meaningful. What's the meaning of my life? Kairos, that word spoken in Matthew or Mark 1.15 is about that. There are certain times in my life when I said yes to speak at Tikva, a Jewish Messianic synagogue on the east side is when Catherine and I first met. That led to just a few months later, between about two months, Catherine, about two months later we were married. That was a Kairos moment. Neither one of us was looking for it, but by God's grace, we found each other and it just changed our life again at, the, at this stage of, of, of our lives. It's a wonderful thing. Followers of Jesus receive the answers to the three great questions that everyone on earth will have asked in some form or another. Jesus gave meaning to the lives of the disciples and he will give that same meaning to us. And the first question is, who am I? Uh, as an immigrant, I felt adrift. Where do I fit in? This is a, these people speak a different language. I don't know anyone except uh, those that live on the farm in Milan. Why am I here? Who am I? And a part of the answer from scripture is that you're a person created and loved by God, that you were brought forth intentionally for this time, for his purpose. And uh, it, it means that when you and I were born, it wasn't by chance, it wasn't an accident. It was from the creator who loved us even before we had been born. In uh, Jeremiah, who had a question of the Lord about his life, his, his work, in Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah says, saying, this is just like what we read in Psalms. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So first of all, God formed him in the womb intentionally. And before I did that, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, you and I are not called as prophets to the nations like Jeremiah was, but the same truth is for us, that before we were born, the Lord knew us and appointed a set time and a purpose for our lives, and our job is to discover that. And that leads to, to, the, to the second question, why am I here? And it's, one, it's a question that we all, at some level, answer. When, when we're little, we answer it differently than when we're a little bit older. But it's to know our Creator who loves you and I in, in a personal way. It's uh, discover God's purpose for our life. Your purpose, each one of us has a different purpose because He's created us uniquely. And therefore, our goal is to find out, Lord, why am I here? How can I be uh, an effective witness for you as a Christian, what does it mean to follow you by the way that I live? To know him and to experience his goodness every day of the rest of my life is what I want. I didn't know that until I came to know Jesus in a personal way. But that's a part of who we are, that you're here intentionally for a perfect purpose, to be a witness. And then thirdly, where am I going? Catherine and I shortly will be going to Liberia. But that's only, that's only for a few weeks. But where am I going beyond that? What happens when I die? Some of us really struggle with that. I have been around uh, people who have been members of the church, churches that I have served over time that ask that question. What happens when I die? How can I know that I'll be with God? And, and the Bible is very clear that in, in John 3, 16, it says, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That the choice is perishing into separation from God for all eternity or being with the Lord forever through Christ. And, and that's that, that choice that ultimately that we get to decide, do I, do I want to go with God or do I want to be separated from him for all eternity in a, in a place scripture calls hell. God made you, he loves you, and uh, he knows precisely what you are and who you are and still loves you. And his call is
to come close to him so that by our, by our walk of faith that we can lead others into the possibility of understanding that there's more to life than what we see. The disciples had no special preparation. It was just in their hearts. They were open to more, and they found that in Jesus. Those are the questions that get at the core meaning of life that all of us, that all of us has, questions that uh, are behind every philosophy, every religion, every educational and economic system. And uh, though a person might look for many different sources for truth, as Christians, we understand and believe that the ultimate revelation of truth is through God's word. That's why we honor it. That's why we listen to it in the service. That's why at home we read, we start our day in God's word. And uh, for me during this, uh, we're, this is the end of our second week of fasting with one more week to come, it has been just so uh, energizing to feel a little bit closer to the Lord through his word and in prayer because we're denying ourselves just a little bit or at least denying our bodies just a little bit makes a, a huge difference. Most people spend their lives consumed with anxiety for their earthly destiny. Will I be able to fulfill what my family needs? Will I be able to provide for those that look to me? Will my health allow me to go forward? And then what happens when I die? What happens on that day when I pass from life on earth into eternity? Disciples threw caution to the winds. They understood that whatever would happen, it was more important to follow Jesus and to have security on the Sea of Galilee. And because of that, they were transformed. God provides moments, Kairos moments, when we say yes to him, and it changes everything. We were uh, reading this week in the news about the beginning of a move of God in Gaza during the, during the uh, horrible war in Israel that many Muslims are, are dissatisfied with what they see from their peers in Hamas. And there, there, has, there have been over 200 people uh, who are known to have experienced Jesus coming to them in their dreams and them giving their hearts to Jesus as opposed to following the ways of Islam. And a former Hamas militant is a, is a minister now in that area, and he talks about the amazing thing that God is doing by his Holy Spirit in a very dark time. For them, it's a, it's a kairos moment. Even though it's painful, there's really hope for them and for their future. And that's what happened with the disciples. Life is about questions. Jesus provides the great answers that we need for our lives. I want to read to you from, in closing from 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is what Paul says. He was anti-early Christian believers. Jesus appeared to him, and his life was transformed. And here's what he says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. God creates life grants repentance, and gives faith. Man is totally unable by himself to do those things which are necessary to enter the kingdom of heaven. Period. Amen. But Jesus fulfills what we need to be in fellowship with the Lord forever. And to me, that, that's the Christian gospel. That's why we come together to hear, to make sure that we've had that kairos moment when our lives are transformed. At the end of the service, if you would like prayer, we would love to pray with you to make sure that you're at that place. Let's stand together now and confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.